Namaskaram. Today I shall talk about the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition and European Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hematology, uh, Hepatology and Nutrition 2022 guidelines on the management of pediatric acute liver failure. As regards fluids and electrolytes in acute liver failure, they mention that 90% maintenance fluids should be given and the fluid to be used is preferably 0.45 DNS with 15 MEQ per liter of potassium. And please don't go by the figure, it is just a representation of fluids. And one must avoid fluids with predetermined composition like isopay. Sodium requirements should be maintained at 2 to 3 milliequivalents per kg per day with a target sodium of 145 to 155 milliequivalents per liter because this may improve intracranial hypertension. But one must be cautious to prevent sustained hypernatremia as again it can be detrimental leading to cerebral ischemia later on. One must treat hyponatremia only when serum sodium is less than 120 milliequivalents per liter or when further fluid restriction is not possible in the patient with acute liver failure. Also, serum phosphate should be targeted at maintaining more than 3 milligrams per deciliter. Ascites is often precipitated by three major factors and these are hypoalbuminemia, excessive fluid administration and infection in these patients. And so the management comprises of treating the precipitating factor, fluid restriction, diuretics should be used only for refractory cases and complications of fluid overload. And one must avoid aggressive diuresis since this may precipitate hepatorenal syndrome. Blood sugar should be maintained between 90 to 120 milligram percent and this is in contrast to the 2017 guidelines which mentioned no target range for glucose. This they do so because both hyper and hypoglycemia may be associated with complications in patients with acute liver failure. Protracted severe hypoglycemia may be suggestive of an underlying metabolic defect and in these cases additional testing should be done for ammonia, lactate and serum amino acids and glucose infusion rate at the rate of 10 to 15 mg per kg per minute and dextrose concentrations of even more than 20% may need to be given in these patients. Arterial ammonia level estimation is ideal but free flowing venous blood may also be used conveniently for determination of hyperammonemic status in the patient with acute liver failure. You know ammonia is detrimental and is the reason for most of the complications occurring in patients with acute liver failure. So management comprises of restricting protein intake to 1 gram per kg per day lactulose to be used in a dose of 0.5 ml per kg to maximum 30 ml per dose adjusted to produce 2 to 4 loose stools per day and uh, the mechanism it works is by acid intraluminal environment favors conversion of ammonia produced by the gut to ammonium ion and thus it decreases the intestinal absorption of ammonia. Rifaximin efficacy is unknown in pediatrics which though works by altering the intestinal microbiome and decreases ammonia production. L-ornithin L-aspartate has not been studied satisfactorily in children and empiric antibiotics and extracorporeal support devices need to be considered in these patients. Now, hepatic encephalopathy staging has been deferred in two age groups that is less than 4 years and more than 4 years and now it is based on 4 parameters which are mental status, reflexes, neurological signs and EEG changes. This is in contrast to the 2017 guidelines given by the same societies in which there was five, the staging of hepatic encephalopathy was from 0 to 5 and in all age groups and it was based only on two criteria that is mental status and reflexes. So this is the staging of hepatic encephalopathy in children less than 4 years of age. And this is the staging in children more than 4 years of age. Anyone interested can go through them in detail. Now these guidelines recommend intracranial pressure monitoring. The indications are stage 3 or 4 encephalopathy, CT scan suggestive of edema, EEG with slowing, hyperammonemia and patients on mechanical ventilation. But non-invasive assessment like op optic nerve sheet diameter and IRS that is near infrared spectroscopy, TMD and transcranial Doppler deserve further study. 
So therapies for raised ICP as we already know are mannitol, hypertonic saline. They have mentioned specific percentage of hypertonic saline to be used and it varies from 2% to 23.4%. The aim is to maintain serum sodium between 145 to 155 milliequivalents per litre as already discussed previously. And forced hyperventilation by brief that is 20 minute busts to reduce PCO2 to less than 34 since extended hypocapnia may place the patient at risk for hypoxia. Also, additional targets have been provided for monitoring raised ICP and they say that we should ICP levels should be maintained such that clinical stability or improvement occurs, ICP levels are less than 20 millimeters mercury and cerebral perfusion pressure. We all know cerebral perfusion pressure is mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. So cerebral perfusion pressure should be targeted at more than 50 millimeters mercury in children less than 4 years of age, more than 55 millimeters mercury in children between 4 to 10 years of age and more than 60 millimeters mercury in children more than 10 years of age. Now for management of coagulopathy one must use IV vitamin K. Platelets and FFP are to be used only in active bleeding or invasive procedure and this is due to increased risk of transfusion associated lung injury that is trali and fluid overload. One must avoid transfusion only to improve the platelet count or the value of INR per se. This is in contrast to 2017 guidelines where they had mentioned specific cutoffs for platelet transfusion which was less than 50,000 in patients with active bleeding and less than 10,000 irrespective of bleeding. Now whatever the patient count platelet count be it is recommended to be transfused only in patients with active bleeding or invasive procedure as per these societies. Cryoprecipitate should be used in low fibrinogen states in which serum fibrinogen level is less than 100 mg per deciliter and recombinant factor 7 should be used to correct INR before ICP monitor placement only because it's expensive and it carries the risk of thrombosis. Also thromboelastography which we know is a demonstration, a graphical demonstration of the each, each step of the coagulation cascade. It is often normal in these patients of ALF because both procoagulant and anticoagulant proteins are decreased and this is normal but the risk of bleeding and thrombosis is there in ALF and this risk is essentially dependent on the balance between the anticoagulant and the procoagulant proteins so thromboelastography might not be that reliable. Continuous venovenous hemofiltration and renal replacement therapy is recommended in AKI secondary to acute liver failure which is in contrast to the 2017 guidelines where they recommended where they said that data is insufficient to recommend RRT in pediatric ALF. Broad spectrum antibiotics should be started after obtaining relevant cultures in patients with clinical suspicion or biochemical changes like TLC, DLC or prognostic markers for sepsis in patients suspected of having infection. This is in contrast to 2017 guidelines which it mentioned that antibiotics should be used in patients with pediatric ALF only if they have systemic inflammatory response syndrome or they have stage 3 or 4 hepatic encephalopathy. Enteral nutrition is preferred over total power enteral nutrition and the aim of total power enteral nutrition is to provide maximum calories with minimal volume. It should restrict protein intake to 1 gram per kg per day especially if patient has hyperammonemia and lipids to be used our lipids should be used except if fatty acid oxidation defect or mitochondrial disease is suspected in the patients with acute liver failure. Now, frequency of monitoring, clinical monitoring and laboratory monitoring, monitoring has been specified based on the stage of encephalopathy. For example, in stage 1, you must monitor the CNS signs every 2 hourly, vital signs every 6 hourly, blood glucose every 8 hourly, and basic metabolic panel which comprises of electrolytes and calcium along with magnesium, ammonia and LFT are to be monitored every 12 hourly at least. In stage 2, CNS signs should be monitored every hour, vital signs every 4 hour, blood glucose, basic metabolic panel, magnesium, ammonia and complete blood counts every 8 hourly 
and liver function tests every 12 hours. And in stage 3, CNS signs are to be monitored every half hourly, that is every 30 minutes, vital signs every hourly, blood glucose, basic metabolic panel, magnesium, ammonia, complete blood counts every 4 hourly, and liver function test every 12 hourly. There is sparse evidence of plasma pheresis in pediatric acute liver failure and it is recommended with other extracorporeal therapy only as a bridge to liver transplant. The King's College Hospital criteria and liver injury units are not valid if liver transplantation and death outcomes are separated from each other. This is in contrast to 2017 where other predictors of outcome had been specially specified and these included serum bilirubin, prothrombin time, ammonia, WBC count and onset of hepatic encephalopathy. Thank you so much for a patient watching and please do share the knowledge. Thanks a lot.